In the August 24th episode, we analyzed that China's current unemployment rate is likely to be as high as 20%. In the face of such a high unemployment rate, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang said that the primary solution is to develop labor-intensive industries. Since July 2021, the Beijing government has tightened regulations on real estate, dampening the enthusiasm and confidence of real estate companies, and the regulatory storm is hitting an increasing number of industries, almost one industry a day. What is this move by Xi Jinping's administration all about? The Wall Street Journal editorialized on August 22nd that a reading of China's outline for the implementation of the rule of law government released in August along with the five-year National Economic Plan released in March 2021 shows a renewed emphasis on manufacturing after years of signaling its intention to promote the service sector. What has happened in recent months is evidence that the Chinese Communist authorities are downplaying the role of the service sector. Previously, the Wall Street Journal published an article on August 9th, China wants manufacturing, not the internet, to lead the economy, noting that even as Beijing unleashes a regulatory assault against tech companies, it continues to shower subsidies and protection on manufacturers. This view is similar to that of economists Cheng Xiaonong and He Qingli. Cheng Xiaonong and He Qingli are a married couple. Cheng Xiaonong was the director of the Comprehensive Research Department of the China Institute for Economic Reform. He Qingli was a lecturer at a Chinese financial institute. They argue that Wall Street analysts are cautious in their speculation, fearing the future of foreign investment in China, and that many in the Chinese media believe that Xi Jinping wants a planned economy and a closed door. However, this is not the case. At the major Communist Party meeting coming up next year in 2022, there is a high probability that Xi will be re-elected, which means he will remain in power for another five years, so the Xi Jinping administration has started a major economic reorientation, which is aimed at shifting China's economy from the fictitious to the real and adjusting the ratio of state-owned enterprises to private ones. The Xi Jinping administration will not completely close the door to the country if it goes back to the planned economy and closed-door lockdown of the Mao era, China's economy will have chosen a path of suicide. China's economy today is already highly dependent on the international market for both resources and markets. So as the Xi Jinping administration embarks on a series of regulatory policies, China's top securities regulator has recently tried to reassure foreign investors that the country has not entirely shut itself down. Some interpretations to this development pattern are one-sided, with too much emphasis being attached on the factor of taking domestic circulation as the mainstay, but getting rid of foreign investment. That's totally a misunderstanding. As a matter of fact, most foreign-funded enterprises in China are practitioners of the dual circles. For the domestic circulation, they are in China and contribute to China, producing, selling, and purchasing domestically. They have already deeply integrated themselves into the domestic circulation. While for the international circulation, foreign-funded enterprises completed two-fifths of China's import and export volume, which has also promoted the positive interplay between domestic and international circulations. We will join some bilateral or multilateral free trade agreements and be an active participant promoter in the reform of WTO. Why did the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, choose to make a drastic economic U-turn? Over the past few decades, as a result of the so-called reform and opening up, China has gradually developed an economic dependence on technology, exports, and capital from Western countries, led by the United States. As relations between China and the United States have deteriorated, an anti-communist sentiment has risen globally. These three factors have become an effective means of restraining the CCP. In all likelihood, the CCP is attempting to respond to the international environment with a domestic economic strategy of transformation from the fictitious economy into real economy. 
In this process, the CCP would have no problem if it hit the U.S. or other Western investors, as this is a necessary measure to reduce dependency. Wall Street has long seen Chinese stocks as the leverage that moves the CCP to ease up and continue to cooperate with the U.S. They have never given up their confidence in the CCP, but if they see this new trend, then international investors may be more than cautious in their attitude towards Chinese stocks. Since November 2020, Chinese regulators have taken more than 50 actions, at least one per week, in industries such as internet companies, the out-of-school training industry, takeout platforms, gaming, and medical and beauty care. As we move into late August, the situation is becoming apparent, and we can see that the common denominator of the industries being rectified is that they all belong to the fictitious or virtual economy. In addition to the fact that the internet industry is considered by the CCP to be involved in network information security, another factor is that the 2020 U.S. election and the performance of several major U.S. high-tech companies that control information dissemination have made the Xi Jinping administration see more hidden dangers. Xi himself has repeatedly said that he wants to develop the technology industry, but now he is turning to strict regulation. The purpose of restraining real estate speculation is to avoid the influx of financial resources into the real estate bubble and increase financial risks. The financial risks in China around 2017 were the large amounts of money that went into real estate and financial products. It created the bubbling of assets, causing many P2P crashes and other forms of financial scams. Also in 2017, Xi Jinping's authorities saw the development of the manufacturing-based real economy as a top priority in restructuring the economy, calling the process transformation from the fictitious economy into real economy. Other industries are likely to be regarded by the Chinese Communist Party as less valuable service industries, which are not part of the national economy that could cripple the economy. At present, China's manufacturing industry is facing a crisis. According to Cheng Xiaonong's analysis, China's manufacturing industry faces the triple pressure of rapidly rising wage, material, and export costs, and survival is becoming increasingly difficult. The rise in wage costs, in addition to labor shortages, is also due to the rapid rise in domestic consumer prices. Without raising wages, it will not be able to retain workers. The rise in material costs is related to China's domestic inflation, as well as the significant increase in the price of imported energy and non-ferrous and ferrous metals and ores. Some of the rises in material costs is due to the CCP's own policies. For example, one reason for the shortage in rising prices of coal in mainland China is that Beijing imposed a ban on the import of Australian coal, wheat, timber, lobster, and other commodities after its government made it clear that it would hold the Chinese authorities accountable for covering up the truth that led to a global pandemic. This move has made the existing shortage of coal, especially the lack of high-quality coal, even more difficult, causing a large number of steel mills that need high-quality coal to reduce their production, and even causing many power plants to be short of power generation due to the lack of coal, limiting power supply in many areas. Many enterprises failed to fulfill their orders on time due to the underrunning of production. Chung said that since May 2021, China's industrial product factory prices have risen by 9% compared to the same period in 2020. Usually the profit margin of Chinese private enterprises can reach 10% after tax. It is excellent. 10% is the lifeline of Chinese enterprises' operation. If production costs rise by 10%, the enterprise will not be able to operate. It will lose money or even close down. Now exporters are also facing rising export costs, including soaring transportation costs, with container shipping rates on international shipping routes rising five times since April 2021 compared to the previous year. The outbreak has disrupted the global supply chain. 
According to Chinese media, five new confirmed local cases were reported at Shanghai Pudong Airport Air Cargo Terminal, or PACTL, on August 20th and 21st. The Shanghai government urgently suspended ground, customs, and air cargo services from August 20th to prevent the spread of the outbreak. Pudong Airport is the largest airport in mainland China, ranking first in mainland China and third in the world in terms of cargo throughput. Third, it has led to a spike in global air freight prices. All three of these pressures of rising costs for manufacturing firms are difficult for the CCP to control, which has heightened its concerns about the future prospects of the manufacturing industry. Against this backdrop, Beijing likely expects to force the labor force into the manufacturing factories through economic restructuring and in this way help the manufacturing factories to lower their wage costs and survive. At the same time, this also solves the problem of China's huge unemployed population. A Xinhua article from 2020 stated, Labor-intensive industries have a positive contribution to stabilizing employment. In manufacturing, for example, although high-end manufacturing is the direction of development, there will still be a large number of labor-intensive enterprises located at the bottom of the manufacturing curve, and they play an important role in absorbing labor force employment. Previously, China's manufacturing labor force has relied mainly on rural workers. The number of rural workers engaged in manufacturing peaked in 2016, but declined by 10 million by 2020. The total number of rural workers in China in 2020 was 286 million, of which 26.4% were over the age of 50. About 75.4 million older rural workers will return to their hometowns by 2025, so the total number of rural workers will decrease to 266 million in 2025, a decrease of 20 million, and will continue to decrease. Over the past few years, factories in China's manufacturing bases, the Pearl River Delta and the Yangtze River Delta, have been having more and more difficulty finding young workers. Many factories have lowered their employment requirements and increased wages to RMB 5,000 to 8,000 per month. Even so, there is still a phenomenon of young people fleeing factories. Nowadays, young people in China have little interest in manufacturing jobs. It is true not only in the big cities, but also in small and medium-sized towns and rural areas. Unlike their parents' philosophy, this generation of young Chinese do not want to be bound by the strict management of factories. They desire freedom and a diverse lifestyle and would instead work as food delivery workers than in factories. What the Chinese Communist government wants now is workers who listen to the party and follow it, who are healthy and who work hard. Industries such as takeout and gaming have encouraged laziness in staying home among the youth. The expansion of universities has created a large number of graduates with high qualifications but no job market. The suppression of education and training industries will, to a certain extent, divert some students to the technical colleges needed in the manufacturing industry. However, the Communist Party's administrative approach to restructuring the industry, which affects many industries in China and the huge foreign investments, is very destructive and the future is uncertain. Finally, let's look at the latest Chinese government bans. What industry did they choose to crack down on recently? You'd never guess, the funeral market. On August 24th, the Shanxi Judicial Administration Network released a draft for input stipulating that the production and sale of paper people, paper horses, paper houses, plutonium and other feudal and superstitious funeral facilities goods are prohibited, among other things. The announcement calls for comments and suggestions to be submitted by September 19th. In other cities in China, some have already started to manage this industry. For example, the Harbin City Administration has already requested to crack down on the city's plutonium paper and coins. The production source, transportation, pipeline, sales, and even burning are not spared. The goal is to make plutonium paper and coins impossible to buy and no paper to burn. 
This past August 22nd was the traditional Chinese festival of Mid-Year Festival, one of the largest ritual festivals among Chinese folk. A mourner will visit a new grave and people in general will worship their ancestors and offer sacrifices to lonely souls and ghosts. Chinese people will burn some paper coins and goods on the roadside in order to give money to those lonely souls who have no one to rely on in the other world, clothing to protect them from the cold and a food to sustain their bellies. It seems that the CCP not only wants to regulate the human market under their rule, but also wants to regulate the distribution of goods in the dimension where ghosts exist.